Whatever a man does on the face of this earth, he leaves it an imprint. And the photo interpreters call that a signature. So looking down on this land, the first thing I would tell is that the people here are meat eaters. I can see cattle in the field. I can see hog pens. and maybe even see a chicken coop or two. I can tell that the people are grain eaters because I can see fields that have been plowed. I can pick out the elementary schools uh, by the playgrounds. I can pick out the religion uh, because if I look in, in this area, uh, most of the steeples uh, of the churches have crosses on them. If you give me comparative coverage, that is coverage over a period of time, I will tell you how many people died in this area by looking at the uh, graveyards and picking up the new graves. So literally, you can follow a man uh, from his birth to his death uh, by looking at the aerial photographs. Since the 1960s, billion dollar satellites and futuristic spy planes have revolutionized intelligence gathering. During the Cold War, they allowed the CIA's photographic interpreters to know the Soviet Union like their own backyards. Such is the detail of aerial photography. It has become instrumental in determining America's foreign policy. I dare say there's hardly a day when the CIA messenger goes over to the White House carrying, uh, he carries a document called the President's Daily Brief, very highly classified document about happenings around the world. But more often than not, he carries a fistful of photographs. All of these photographs are telling the President, this is what's happening. In a career spanning more than 40 years, Dino Brugioni has himself briefed five presidents. Using imagery from spy satellites, he could even take them on an aerial tour of Moscow. This is a KH-4 Corona photograph uh, taken of Moscow in 1972. Different spots would be pointed out that we knew would be of interest to the president. Uh, here you can clearly see the Kremlin. There's St. Basil's Cathedral. And if you look close, you see a line and those are people lined up to, uh, to visit Lenin's tomb. We actually took some of these photographs up a thousand times. And so you can imagine the quality of the uh, film. The strategic and tactical value of detailed aerial reconnaissance was firmly established during the Second World War. The skills and techniques pioneered by the RAF then are still in use today. The mission that we train for is the hardest of the photo reconnaissance missions, and that's uh, high speed, low level photo reconnaissance. And in many ways, that's carrying on the uh, traditions from the Second World War onwards, where we used uh, unarmed high speed Spitfires in the fighter reconnaissance role. In many ways, things haven't changed. We still use low level flight to evade uh, enemy defences, and we try and get in and out as quick as we can before anybody can do too much about it. On one level, it, the world doesn't seem to be going past as fast as you think it ought to if you look at the bare statistics. You're talking about cruising at nearly 500 miles an hour or 8 miles a minute. And yet, when you actually do it, the ground just appears to roll under you at quite a, 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 quite a gentle rate. It's only when you do something like reconnaissance and you actually look at a target uh, and try and build that mental picture uh, that you realise just quite how quickly that target is approaching uh, and then receding and you're still trying to count the aerials or the power supplies or the number of admin buildings attached or whatever else you're supposed to report on. In 1991, the Jaguars of 41 Squadron served in the Gulf War. Equipped with five cameras to provide horizon-to-horizon -horizon coverage, they are the last of the RAF reconnaissance squadrons still to use traditional film. We're not talking 21st century laser technology here. The nose camera in the reconnaissance pod on the Jaguar, uh, the F-95 uh, Mark VII, I believe, uh, was the same one that used to fly in the Spitfires during the Second World War. But then lens technology has not actually increased markedly in that time, and it's still a very good camera for low-level photo reconnaissance. And the skill is to put your aircraft in the right piece of sky 
uh, to get the target on the camera that you want to uh, produce the best quality image possible. The imagery uh, that we produce is actually really quite good at seeing through camouflage. And one of the reasons is uh, stereoscopy. We don't just take a single image of the target, but we take overlapping images. So typically 60 or 70 percent uh, of an image is covered on the next frame. Now when you look at that through uh, specialised optics, you focus one eye on each image and you see a 3D picture. Oh yes, that's lovely. Funny little stereo. Yeah, it's such a long time. Nearly 60 years ago, the same principle helped photographic interpreters like Diana Cussens track the movement of German troops and supplies across Europe on a daily basis. Oh, it's marvellous. And now, if I had last time's cover, then you look at what was in that dock last time. Oh, there's three more ships in there. What are they? And then you look at the next one. Oh, that one's gone. I wonder where it's gone. So it's comparison and interest and curiosity. Based at Medmenham in the south of England, by the end of the war, the Allies' Photographic Interpretation Unit was providing an astonishing 80% of all Allied intelligence. If you do a lot of interpretation with photographs, you get to know the harbours and the airfields on site. And from the north of Norway into the Baltic, Stettin, and then Kiel, which was ghastly, it was so huge, Kiel, and then down through the Low Countries and France into the Mediterranean up to the tankers in Genoa. But you had to search each photograph. And it was fascinating what you learned. The massive operation was split into three phases. Firstly, an initial assessment of the film was made, immediately an aircraft returned to base, then it was sent for further analysis. It was taken down to Medmenham, where it was processed and put into photographs. The whole, a whole reel of film was photographed. And we were second phase, which was just that much more detailed. And we had to follow the movement of the shipping and the movement of cruisers and battleships. The third phase, which was key to Allied success over the Germans, was the use of a diverse range of both civilian and military experts to evaluate every aspect of the Nazi war machine. Your reports must be clear, concise English. I suppose the boffins upstairs had to know exactly, but accurate to a degree. Today, battlefield commanders require intelligence reports at an instant, and wherever 41 Squadron are sent, they take with them their own reconnaissance intelligence centre, known as the RIC. Now, the RIC itself would typically be, uh, for a small-scale RIC, would be composed of five actuals. All actuals are really slightly high-tech caravans, which are uh, air transportable, and they'd be arranged in, uh, in a RIC clutch such that they're all interconnecting. The only place on the battlefield with air conditioning, the RIC contains everything needed to process and interpret the reconnaissance imagery. When the aircraft lands, it will be uh, taxied in by the engineers, and uh, even before the engines are off, the engineers will be underneath the recce pod and they'll be taking the magazines of film out. They'll be taken to the RIC, where they will be processed immediately. They are blue, yellow. And one would hope to process those magazines within eight minutes of them being removed from the aircraft. That then leaves about half an hour for the photographic interpreters to look through the film, find the priority targets and get a signal message uh, off back to your tasking authority. Two minutes, I need the report. Specialist reconnaissance aircraft cost millions to develop, but one of the RAF's most successful spy planes, which flew behind the Iron Curtain on an almost daily basis for 44 years, cost the taxpayer considerably less. It's a chipmunk single-engine aircraft, 145 horsepower. First flew in 1946, would you believe? But it's a robust airplane, a reliable airplane. And uh, I think that's really why we enjoyed using it in Berlin. We had sort of complete faith in it. At the end of the Second World War, as the Allies divided up Berlin, 
The Soviets were persuaded to allow each of the military missions stationed there to fly a training aircraft in order that pilots assigned to the British mission, Bricksmiths, could maintain their flying pay. Every opportunity, pilots would go into the air. Well, it was found, of course, that uh, flying within the Berlin control zone, which is 20 statute miles radius, it covered uh, not only East Berlin, but quite a lot of East Germany. So, of course, the first time uh, somebody went flying, they said, my God, we can see all sorts of things from here. And I think that's really how it all started, almost by accident. The chipmunk allowed the British to secretly observe and photograph all new military equipment and units they spotted on the massive Soviet bases covered by the fly zone. Photographer was the most important person in the aeroplane, actually. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> you needed to spot things and so you could tell your pilot, you know, where you wanted to go exactly. Christ, look at that, round again, round again! <laughs> <laughs> yes, well. basically. Yes, yeah, so I, I was sitting in front and we saw something of real interest. Before you go round at a sort of 60 degree, 70 degree bank turn and take as many photographs as you could within, say, three turns around it. But the Russian troops were always wary of the tiny plane's real purpose. Often the guns would go around with you. As you went round something, you could see the guns following you. And Sighting you practice. Yeah, just practice for them. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he weren't sure where. <laughs> we just hoped someone didn't pull the trigger. Yeah. <laughs> I know when I was there of uh, three occasions where the aircraft was in fact shot at. In fact, there is a photograph of a Soviet soldier with the Kalashnikov actually pointing the rifle. To avoid any international incidents, it was imperative the true nature of the flights were kept secret. The crews were given strict instructions as to what to do if they were forced to land in the Russian zone with the cameras on board. If we came down with everything on board, the little drain cocks under the wing, um, the idea was to drain a bit of fuel out and then set fire to it and burn it all up. <laughs> and then say it wasn't us. <laughs> we, have, we know nothing about this. <laughs> On the 2nd of October 1990, a day before the reunification of Germany, the chipmunk made its final spy flight over Berlin. On the 22nd of December, 1964, deep in the Mojave Desert, flight testing began on the world's fastest ever spy plane. The secrecy was paramount. The origin of this was uh, in the nether netherlands of the CIA. And uh, you couldn't even tell your wife anything about it or when you would go or when you would come. Designed to fly at more than 100,000 feet, nearly 20 miles above the Earth's surface, this is the revolutionary Lockheed Blackbird. The SR-71 Blackbird, in which I sit, was uh, operational in the USAF on a clandestine basis. The mission was described as global strategic reconnaissance. That was the purpose and function of the SR-71 Blackbird. It's a standard cockpit layout for a fighter. The two throttles are over here, the stick's here in the middle with a bunch of buttons on it. And uh, of course, we got switches and gauges all over the thing. And uh, it, the idea is to know when to look at what when. That's where your training comes in. Originally called the RS-71 Blackbird, the name had to be changed to SR-71 Blackbird when President Lyndon Johnson mixed the letters up at a press conference confirming the plane's existence. Technologically, it was extremely difficult to design this airplane. It is indeed, as we speak, the world's fastest airplane. It does about 22, 2300 statute miles per hour. It could go to 2500 easily. It used to be that we could not reveal that speed, but now uh, I'm permitted to say that the maximum design speed of this airplane is 3.2 Mach and it gets very, very hot there. We're designed for 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of the heat generated by the friction of air when traveling at three times the speed of sound, 
The SR-71 had to be made out of titanium, so it would not melt. This meant the aircraft had to incorporate expansion joints, which, disconcertingly, causes fuel to leak from the aircraft when on the runway. However, once at its cruising speed, they become sealed as the aircraft expands by more than two inches in length. I used to come out here to test the thing and they'd have a manifold under each wing with a 55 gallon drum to capture it all and run it into the drum and they'd say, uh, this is okay to fly, of course. And uh, it's true that we use an exotic fuel, which means it's got a low flash point. And uh, we needed this low flash point to go with this high temperature so it wouldn't experience this phenomenon known as an autogenous ignition, which means it blows up. The SR-71 burns through a phenomenal amount of fuel. When they entered service in 1966, in-flight refueling was a necessity, but it allowed the CIA to monitor events on the other side of the world with unparalleled speed. Probably the most distinguished bit of flying I think uh, I've ever observed was uh, during the Yom Kippur War. Nobody would give us bases, and so SR-71s uh, were staged out of Griffith Air Force Base in New York. They would fly to the uh, battlefield. They would have to be tankered three times. The SR-71s had to come down to about 25,000 feet, had to come under a tanker, take on fuel, and then go back up. Had to do this three times to the battlefield, three times back. The SR-71s would take off at night and be over the battlefield in the morning. They would return, the film would be processed, we would interpret the photography, and we'd have the information on the president's desk that night. Flying on the edge of the atmosphere, the pilots had to wear special suits. Without them, if the cockpit depressurized, the oxygen in their bodies would evaporate, making their blood literally boil. Now we get to do your leak check, so when you're ready, go ahead and take a deep breath and hold it. It takes a lot of getting used to wearing that moon suit, the full pressure suit. Uh, and that was uncomfortable in the beginning until we figured out how to improve upon it. It is made of uh, rubber, and the company that built it used to make women's uh, undergarments like brassieres and girdles and so forth, and therefore they knew how to manufacture rubberized garments, and that's how it evolved into the pressure suit. The lessons of high-altitude spy flights had been learnt with the SR-71's predecessor, the U-2 which had been designed and built in the mid-1950s. Using the U-2s to make secret reconnaissance flights over the Soviet Union, the CIA hoped it would answer their most burning question. Did the Soviets have enough nuclear bombers and missiles to annihilate the Western world? A reconnaissance system such as the U-2, while it was valuable, could only see several miles on each side of its flight path, and if you're a 10 or 15 miles beyond that, you were safe. We didn't know it was there. In 1957, the Soviets launched the world's first satellite, Sputnik 1. Petrified of a technological disadvantage, the Americans rapidly embarked on their own massive space program. The space race had begun. The Americans' first objective was to develop a spy satellite codenamed Corona. For the men charged with building it, the problems were enormous. We knew nothing about how to design a satellite. Never mind, we knew nothing about how to simulate things in space. So we knew that we we're, were gonna build something, fly it up there, test it, and it was gonna fail. We knew it was gonna fail. The first 12 launches failed, but getting into orbit was not the only problem. The key to the system's success would be the development of a reliable camera which could provide enough detail to be of use to the photographic interpreters. My job was to uh, oversee the development of the camera in a specific sense and make it prove on the ground that it could handle the launch uh, uh, vibrations and forces that existed and then operate in the uh, environment that existed in space, about which we knew very, very little. Only a special film could provide the resolution needed, and once exposed, it could not be replaced. As the life of each Corona satellite would be limited by the amount of film it could carry, the question was how much of the Soviet Union could each mission photograph? Each uh, photograph took about 100 miles 
across the line of flight and about 11 miles along the line of flight. That was on a piece of film that was about 29 inches long by about two and three quarters wide. And that mean, meant we took a picture about every one and a half seconds. By the 13th mission, the Americans had successfully got a test satellite into space. But now they had to perfect a way of retrieving the exposed film. The plan was to eject it from the satellite in a capsule known as a bucket, then catch it using a specially adapted aircraft as it parachuted back to Earth. In the early days, uh, our biggest problem uh, in losing buckets was we were missing our re-entry point by many, many miles. So we sent airplanes out, they could never find it. And in the meantime, the, the capsule had landed in the ocean someplace. Second problem we had was uh, when the parachute opened um, and we tried to catch it with the airplane, we'd, we'd snag the parachute and it would rip and we would lose the capsule. It fell into the water and the airplane couldn't catch it. On the 18th of August, 1960, the 14th Corona mission proved successful, and the first object ever to be retrieved from space and then caught in midair contained spy pictures of the Soviet Union. In order to be of intelligence value, we had to achieve a resolution of two meters. Now, what that means in layman term is that you can identify an object that is two meters in size and know whether it's a car or a tank or a truck. That was the key accomplishment of Corona at that time. The first mission got more film uh, and more coverage of the Soviet Union than all of the U-2 missions combined. It just revolutionized intelligence. Ironically, the Soviet security measures now only helped the Americans identify their most secret installations. The Soviets had a penchant for security. And in this case, you'll see two areas here that stand out. And when you look at those areas, you find that they're intermediate range ballistic missile sites. Look at this, one, two, three, four, five fences. So security is a dead giveaway that there's something important uh, about the target. We were providing precise information. Now, two things, one, the president could make decisions on it as far as the uh, Defense Department budget. But what we were also providing, we were providing the defense people information on their weapon systems. In other words, we could provide them information on their submarines so that they could counter weapon the submarine. We were providing them information on the bombers so that they could counter weapon the bombers and so forth. So we saved the Defense Department billions of dollars. In total, 145 Corona satellites were launched until, in 1972, digital technology made them redundant, as detailed intelligence could now be beamed directly back to Earth. Today, amongst the thousands of satellites orbiting the Earth, no one knows how many of them are really spies in the skies. schools uh, by the playgrounds. I can pick out the religion uh, because if I look in, in this area, uh, most of the steeples uh, of the churches have crosses on them. If you give me comparative coverage, that is coverage over a period of time, I will tell you how many people died in this area by looking at the uh, graveyards and picking up the new graves. So literally you can follow a man uh, from his birth to his death uh, by looking at the aerial photographs. Since the 1960s, billion dollar satellites and futuristic spy planes have revolutionized intelligence gathering. During the Cold War, they allowed the CIA's photographic interpreters to know the Soviet Union like their own backyards. Such is the detail of aerial photography, it has become instrumental in determining America's foreign policy. 
I dare say there's hardly a day when the uh, CIA messenger goes over to the White House carrying, uh, he carries a document called the President's Daily Brief, very highly classified document about happenings around the world. But more often than not, he carries a fistful of photographs. All of these photographs are telling the President this is what's happening. In a career spanning more than 40 years, Whatever a man does on the face of this earth, he leaves it an imprint. And the photo interpreters call that a signature. So looking down on this land, the first thing I would tell is that the people here are meat eaters. I can see cattle in the field. I can see hog pens. And maybe even see a chicken coop or two. I can tell that the people are grain eaters because I can see fields that have been plowed. I can pick out the elementary